my 10,000 steps yet today, so if I don't walk around, I'll end up in the gym later on or something. So uh, thank you, Dilsey, and for Kevin for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, some interesting um, data science strategies, I suppose, around food safety, uh, uh, risk assessment, and nutritional resu resu results and research. So I'll talk a little bit about a digitized world. So just a quick disclosure, I am the founder of this company, and um, we work with industry and government so some of the work here would have been funded by various partners from industry and government. So what do I mean by a digitized world? So the concept of digital density is an interesting one. And if we think about phone connections into um, things, or digital internet connections into things, right? Back in the 1970s, maybe only the biggest factory might have had one phone line into their organization, or the biggest company might have had one phone line. And, and over time then, you know, in the 90s, each house would have had one phone line into their house. And of course we know now that each person carries their own digital connection with them everywhere they go. It's their phone. And then moving on into today, it's not just one connection per person, but it's one connection per thing. And there's multiple connections for a lot of things. So just the amount of digital connections in the world has expanded massively over the last 30 or 40 years. So modern cars would have 15 or 20 digital connections, 3G connections to the internet these days. Um, every smallest little thing may have its own digital connection pumping out data to the inter internet. So of course this leads to exponential data growth, which is a hu huge challenge to deal with that growth. Uh, some estimates have said only 4% of all data that gets generated ever gets analyzed. And because of this rapid growth of data, even just staying with that 4% is going to be a challenge. But also, of, of course, it's a, there's a massive opportunity. And the challenges with data science that we've come to recognize over the years in our company, and I'll get on to a little bit more about how this affects food and nutrition in a moment, but if we want to get to the top of this pyramid of predictive analytics and get real insight and foresight into what's going on in, in the physical world or in the, the safety and nutritional world, there's a lot of uh, grunt work, I suppose, that has to be done. And it's far more work at the bottom of this period in collecting and structuring the data that we need to use. So uh, I think data science is one of the sexiest jobs at the moment um, on uh, LinkedIn and, and in the international media. But actually, uh, most of the work they do is not that sexy in that they're probably doing a lot of cleaning of data uh, and trying to get the data to, to, st to a certain structure so that they can actually even start doing basic analytics. And eventually, and maybe only 5% of the work actually comes up at the very top, which is the really exciting stuff around predictive analytics. So I'm going to talk through that in the, um, in the way that this affects some of the work we've done in food safety and nutritional research over the last 15 or so years. Um, as a company, we, we curate and gather a lot of data from around the world. Some of it's public data, like the NHANES data from CDC and the USDA uh, food composition data and all of the different types of food consumption and composition data from all around the world. And of course, these all come with different idiosyncrasies, different coding systems, different types of treatments for missing data, etc. So getting that all structured in such a way that it can, it can run smoothly through some kind of model or predictive analytics toolkit takes a lot of work. So a lot of work on the left, but at the end of the day, once you can do that, you can get some power from that data. So talking about then food safety and nutrition research, in, in food safety, um, we've, we've heard a little bit about hazards uh, and chemical hazards, but of course, um, in terms of risk assessment and risk analysis for food safety, it's not just a hazard that's important. You have to consider the exposure of that hazard and also potentially the lesser, uh, I suppose, thing we think about is actually different people and the inter-individual variability in terms of vulnerability to that uh, hazard and exposure. So right in the middle of that, we end up with the actual risk. So I'm going to talk about some of the data sets and work you can do around this to, to try to solve this risk analysis problem. So starting with exposure, um, what do, in terms of food safety or nutrition, so if we're looking at this from a food safety point of view or even from a nutritional benefit point of view, this is the important uh, information that we need. So we need to understand our population of consumers what they're eating, and of course, what, what's in those foods, and then we can get an inf a, a reasonable feel for the types of um, 
uh, exposure risks. So for the start, we, we can get food consumption data, like the Anne Haynes data set uh, here in the US, or different data sets that are available around Europe. In terms of um, the, what's in the foods, those data sets typically will come with nutritional composition data that can be combined into that food consumption. You can substitute that with, with further information on reformulation or different things around foods. Or if you're interested in food safety, you need to know something about the chemical occurrence and concentration of the potential hazards or chemicals in those foodstuffs. And that, can tip, that, that type of information might come from a, a PDP type database, which is the pesticide um, control uh, monitoring service here in the US. So you can, you can mine that data to, to build up a, a database of chemical occurrence and concentration, combine that with your food consumption data, and what you end up with, you can get a data distribution then of um, the nutritional profile of your consumers or the potential exposure of those consumers to any chemical of interest. And how, you, how we do that is using a probabilistic intake model. So the food consumption database will record for this uh, thousands of consumers, for example, in the N. Haynes database, all of the information on what they're consuming. These are coded in terms of the food codes and the amounts are known. And then they can be combined in with the potential contamination of the chemical in each foodstuff. Of course, you don't know um, exactly what chemical is in every food because you've only got two separate databases informing this information. So this is a type of probabilistic uh, issue here. The, the food may contain the chemical. If it does contain the chemical, it may have a certain concentration. You don't know both of those things all of the time. For nutrition, you, you may know that all of the time, but for chemical exposure, you may not. So what we do is we assign probabilities to those based on the data sets from the monitoring programs, from the chemical information that we can find from literature, and we assign probabilities that they're present, and if present, a type of distribution to represent that presence. And then we can iterate through the whole database, basically calculating the exposure of each eating event for each consumer, adding that up, and then getting each consumer's daily average. And at the end of the day, you will have uh, thousands of consumers. Some of them will have a low exposure to the chemical, and some of them will have a higher exposure. And you can take things like the mean exposure for your population, which is interesting. But often for um, a hazard, or the median, of course, you're more interested in those people who are getting exposed to a high level of the chemical. So we may look at something like the P95 or the 95th percentile consumer exposure. So we end up with some kind of distribution like this. Um, exposure in milligrams per kilogram per day in terms of exposure to a chemical. And we know from our hazard association, our, our, our risk assessment, our hazard characterization of that particular chemical that we have a safe dose that we don't want people to exceed. But we see on this particular graph that there are actually some consumers who have gone above that dose. Does that make sense? So you have low consumers, high consumers, most consumers are in the middle, they're not getting too much. Then the, some people are on the right, they're getting too much, and some of them have exceeded our reference dose. So what, what does that mean? Okay, well, we can actually dive into the data and see why they're getting exposed to too much, what food categories are driving that exposure, what age group those people might be, are they male or female, um, where do they live, it, certain things like that. But also, um, the question is, well, does it actually matter for those consumers? Are they the kind of consumers who are sensitive to uh, this chemical or not? And we heard a little bit about personalized um, nutrition, and we're starting to understand some um, links between food and people's particular um, phenotypes and genotypes, and some people are more or less sensitive to a particular chemical or nutrient. Um, so that's where the, the vulnerability part comes in, and we're understanding now more about the, the inter-individuals, and it was quite interesting listening to a couple of talks already today, and it seems like we're getting much more sophisticated in the way we're thinking about things, not treating everything the same anymore, but actually looking at the inter-individual variability as well as the population variability. And we're starting to understand a lot more about personalized medicine and drugs, but also personalized risk, personalized nutrition. And this is based on genetics and, and starting to understand patients and consumers. So for example, in this group, um, you may have 
four different cohorts um, where the drug may be toxic but not beneficial, not great for them. Um, the drug is not toxic and it's beneficial, it's pretty good for those people. Drugs toxic, drug toxic but beneficial, not so good. Drug not toxic, not beneficial, not great for them either. So it's interesting when you start to be a, being able to understand these things. So in a digitized world, I like to think about this as a data science challenge. <laughs> because uh, well, what does that mean really? What is, what is a data scientist? Like, aren't we all data scientists? We're scientists dealing with data all the time. And I think that's actually true, right? We all need to be good data scientists these days as a scientist. But um, I suppose what a data scientist does is takes that to the next level. So a good data scientist, I think, should be very strong in maths and stats. They should be able to write programming type scripts to kind of organize large volumes of data and analyze it. Um, they should be able to um, communicate those results in an in a, uh, articulate way. They should be able to understand things like um, study design and bias and all of those things. So when you start to add all those things together, it's very hard to find people with all those skills. So I like to think of data science more as a team sport where you may have two or three people between them may have all of those skills. So in a data science challenge and, and the way we like to think, we like to use as much of the available data um, as we can. So going back to our triangle of getting from collection, I'll just show, walk through a few examples of how we do that and how that can be done in the food safety and nutrition space. So in terms of gathering data, structuring data, analyzing, visualizing data and predictive modeling. So I'll go through some examples. Gathering data, food consumption data, well of course, there's a lot of food consumption data out there already. It's ready to go, um, ready to use. And most of it's publicly available. You can just access it, organize it, and start using it. If that's not enough, or if you want to do something even more specific, there are now um, methods, and we were spoken about this morning, I think nutritionresearch.org or nutrition.org spoke about many different types of um, online type uh, data collection, food consumption collection, uh, tools um, and this one we used in the food for me study which is a personalized nutrition study and we used an online food frequency questionnaire and then I suppose the nice thing about this is that it um, can be delivered digitally again so you can access thousands of consumers quickly and cheaply and we also put a lot of thought into um, design so that it was prompting people to remember maybe things they they had it was very easy to use and it replaced that paper and pen um, and dietitian kind of hands-on um, methodology. So the, the key issue, the key message here is that um, large data can be collected more quickly and easily now with digital tools. So these types of tools are available. This is another one um, that we collaborated with UCD on called Foodbook 24, which is a 24-hour recall. And you can see they're quite user-friendly. And once you can, um, I suppose, um, gather your study cohorts group, you can, you can, you can access uh, these types of technologies to uh, gather new food consumption data, more targeted food research than you could before. And these are ideal for um, geographies or, or countries in the developing world where there may not be um, good food consumption data available. So these are starting to be used now in places like Russia and the Middle East where, where they don't have those government sponsored food consumption surveys that are happening. Another interesting example is um, trying to get industry to collaborate and we, with, by providing uh, information that they find they would um, treat as very proprietary. So this is a project we've worked on with RIFM, the Research Institute for Fru Fragrance, Research Institute for Fragrance um, in New Jersey. And we've, we've set up a secure data collection portal. And what we're trying to do here is survey industry around the, their usage of fragrance compounds in, in um, personal care and food products. Now this type of data is not the kind of data they would like to particularly, uh, they're very particular about sharing. And this is, this is the kind of uh, supply chain, I suppose. The fragrance manufacturers create these mixtures and those mixtures are used in by companies who make the finished product. And neither one necessarily wants to disclose the um, ratios and formulations that they use. But with, through RIFM and with a secure kind of portal approach, we were able to uh, set up a system where we could gather this type of information from the different parts of the supply chain, anonymize that data um, as a, an industry, 
and make it available then back to industry and government in terms of doing risk assessments. So with a kind of a secure, honest broker data approach where a third party could, who doesn't um, disclose the contents of that data to anybody, can actually gather it all, obfuscate it behind a secure kind of firewall, but make a model available to people who can then analyze that data across the industry without seeing any of the, the raw data themselves has been a very productive um, project. We've heard a lot about genomic data and this is why it's becoming so powerful. If you look at Moore's law and the, the speed and increase in computing power and the, the reduction in cost in computing power has been massively significant. But if you think about the cost of um, next generation sequencing, it's actually been even faster accelerating in terms of the reduction in costs in genetic data and, and genetic um, data collection. So this is sparking a massive uh, revolution in the amount of data that you can gather quickly and cheaply. And, and we've heard a number of talks about this already, but it just opens up huge opportunities to use new data sources from the, tr the traditional way of doing risk assessment to the much more personalized and powerful ways of w doing assessments with omics. So I'll just go through the right hand side here. You can look um, far more personalized. You can, you can measure um, risk much more individually. You can quantify strains of pathogens um, in a manufacturing plant much more cheaply and uh, cost effectively than it could before. And uh, of course, before all of this, you just have to think of them all the same. Um, but now you can actually start to pull them apart and identify them. IoT is uh, obviously huge, and we mentioned at the start the, um, the expansion of the number of connections and the number of things um, connected to the internet. And of course, in food safety, this is already happening in terms of sensor data and food production, where time, temperature, pH, humidity, and pressure can all be measured so cheaply and quickly and, and in real time across the supply chain of manufacturing and transport, etc. And it's also moving into smart agriculture. But just as a very simple example, um, just to show how this can be done, this um, sensor is made by a company called Donalto. So we put it in our fridge because it's so cheap. They just put it in for fun. Basically, it costs about $20. But it, it goes into your fridge, and it measures the temperature, the humidity, and any vibrations. So basically, you can see here, um, we don't have the, the day of the week, but um, I think this was a, fr oh yeah, we looked at the data, this was a Friday, and this is our fridge. So I think this, we were having kind of drinks after work that day, so you can see here it was a busy period where they were loading the drinks into the fridge, um, quiet enough then for the afternoon, and then in the afternoon and the evening we were enjoying the drinks party, and then it was the weekend, and then Monday came back, and you can see here the, uh, the fridge temperature starts to uh, uh, start going up again as, as people are opening and closing the door. So just a real simple technology. Um, really cheap but powerful. You know, this stuff is, is starting to really supply data into the, the world of food safety and nutrition. So then, um, a quick a couple of examples of predictive modeling. Um, and I want to go to nutritional intake modeling for this one. And this is the food and drink industry in Ireland, uh, the reformulation product project. Uh, what we've done here is used um, all of the types of modeling as we looked at before in terms of population food consumption data, but this was supplemented again by industry data using a similar kind of secure portal approach where industry were willing to upload information. So four, 14 different companies, and these are the major food, uh, food production companies in Ireland, looked at um, 600 products. Um, we, we supplied the dietary habits from the, um, the IUNA or NANS databases. Market shares came from a third party company and looked at the um, reformulation of these products over 10 years. And the key um, goal was to, to quantify the impact of the voluntary reformulation that these industry uh, companies went to in terms of the five key um, nutritional and macronutrients of energy, fat, uh, saturated fat, sugar, and sodium. So these companies had gone to a lot of effort to reformulate their products over 10 years, and they wanted to understand the real impact that was going to have on consumers, that had, actually had on consumers um, between the, the time period of 2005 and 2012 in this case. So we, we uh, set up these portals, we collaborated with industry to gather that information on their formulations, we gathered the market share information, we used the, the baseline food consumption data as, as the baseline of our model. 
and we modeled the, um, the dietary um, nutritional profiles of consumers for those five key nutrients in both time periods and we looked at the, the reductions across the population. So the key thing was that we didn't want to say something like 2,000 tons of sodium was removed from the Irish diet, you know, between those two time periods on a per annum basis or whatever. And then you can say, oh well, there's 3.5 million people in Ireland, so on average that might be, you know, this much grams per person, which is all fine. But that's just a mean. Remember, it's a full distribution of sodium that would have been consumed by consumers. And some people were at the low end, some people were at the high end. So with this level of detail in the data, we, weren't able, we were able to go far beyond the tons per annum removed and just the mean consumer across the whole population to look at. Well, what about children? What about males only? What about females only? What about adults between the age of 35 and 55? And we could actually look at each demographic group and see the impact across those five micronutrients of the reductions that those companies had made to their products. And there were some significant reductions um, uh, in terms of some of the categories we saw up to 45% reductions for some group consumer groups for, for some of the results uh, for sodium, for example. And I can show you um, more of this. There's a full report and papers. Another study, um, this final one I'd like to talk about is this Food For Me uh, personalized nutrition study um, that Lorraine was also involved in, in UCD. And um, again, data collection through online methods. And what we tried to do there was to uh, split the 2,000 consumers or so, which were from all across Europe, into four different cohorts. And they were given, uh, personal, they were given nutritional advice. Uh, the zeroth level, I suppose, cohort was given standard nutritional advice, you know, eat five fruit and vegetable a day, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other three cohorts were given more personalized advice. Level one was simply based on things like their diet, age, and gender. Level two was based on all of that, plus some uh, phenotype data taken from their blood. And level three was uh, even more personalized advice based on all of that, plus some uh, genotype, plus their genotype data, where the personalized advice was now based on all of the information that the researchers and dietitians knew about that person, including and up to including their gene genotype. So um, that's what I just said. Um, we used all of the, these, these types of um, information. Um, this was all done online. And this is where the whole collaboration, I suppose, kicks in. Um, the, the, uh, the participants were able to uh, contribute all of that data online. The researchers were able to log in online and start looking at data. They were able to look through all of this information on each of their participants. Um, and they were able to create these uh, recommendations or reports for the participants. And in the end of the project, what we wanted to be able to do was to automate all of that process from uh, participant reporting their information to the nutritional recommendations coming back to them. And we did that more or less just by creating decision trees where the decision trees in the algorithm mimicked exactly what the dietitian would have told those consumers. And we did that uh, successfully, I suppose, by the end of the project. And these were some interesting results that came from the, um, the uh, study. And if we look at the control group, like everybody actually, like we're, we're looking for energy reduction as a, as a positive thing in terms of people, because in terms of their health and their diet, they, they want, we want them to reduce energy, I suppose, in most cases. Um, and of course, the, the control group was important because they would, just by being in the study, they were probably motivated to become healthier and, and to get a healthier diet. And this is some of the things you, you were talking about in, the, in terms of the placebo effect, et cetera. Um, and then in terms of uh, people in, in the personalized nutrition group, which is one, two, or three, we saw that they actually had a better, um, a more, uh, res responded better in terms of improving their diet, which is positive, I suppose. The interesting thing across this is level one, diet only was actually very strongly responding. Level two, diet plus phenotype, actually not quite as good. And level three, diet plus phenotype plus genotype was also, um, not as good. If you look at healthy eating index as a, as a result, um, level one was pretty good, level two was better, and actually the genotype, adding that into the mix didn't seem to help people respond better to the nutritional advice, which is interesting. 
So just to wrap up, um, food safety and nutrition in a digitized world, these are all the data, data, it is a data science challenge and data science is a team sport, as I said, uh, so we need to collaborate in, a, in these uh, multidisciplinary teams. I want to skip to my takeaways, I'm not going to go through this. Um, key takeaways, uh, try to think like a data, science, time, data scientist, which means um, try to use these digital tools to gather and access as much data as you can. Build a team, because data science is a team sport, and there are systems and portals that can be created or can be leveraged to help um, these types of projects. With that, I'll hand it back. Thank you.